have superpowers and so the technology he employs uh, which he's able to finance uh, through his great wealth and through his company give him the advantage that he needs to fight crime. Batman invents out of necessity. Problem with the graphite, sir. The next 10,000 will be up to specifications. When he finds something that's lacking in his arsenal of technology, he'll go out and try to find a solution for it. So in a certain sense, you could say it's limitless. Since his very first appearance in the pages of Detective Comics, Batman has used the iconography of a bat to strike fear into the hearts of Gotham City's most notorious arch-criminals. Where are you? Here. Ah! But unlike many other superheroes who have gene-altered gifts or possess out-of-this-world superpowers, Batman must rely on science to give him an edge over his enemies. Well, he has to use technology in order to solve crimes and capture criminals. Other superheroes just use their superpowers. Batman relied on skill and technical knowledge. Now, you couldn't really grow up to be Superman, but if you're really cool and really dedicated and really focused, you could become the Batman. Bruce Wayne, of course, is a billionaire. He can have the cutting edge technology he wants. Doesn't matter what kind of materials he wants to buy. And he's got uh, the best people in the world working for him. Well, what is it today? One of the great things about Batman is that he has access to Lucius Fox and his department where they come up with all these amazing gadgets. Here we are. Kevlar utility harness, gas-powered magnetic grapple gun, the 350-pound test monofilament. As envisioned by comic book creator Bob Kane in 1939, Batman was originally more of a super sleuth than a superhero. In fact, his first crime-fighting gadgets were not much more sophisticated than standard lockpicks, passkeys, and an occasional glass cutter. He was always on the cutting edge, but, you know, <laughs> picks and cutters were probably the cutting edge in 1939. Much of the early stories, it was really the technology of convenience. It was what people knew. Comic books were written for kids in the early days. They assumed the audience was 10 to 12 years old at best, and they weren't worried about addressing the technology of the time because they didn't figure the kids understood the technology at the time. There were smoke pellets, gas bombs, things along those lines and able to disable or confuse. These are the traditional weapons that Batman's able to pull out in order to achieve what he needs to achieve. But there was one weapon Batman refused to carry for nearly all of his crime-fighting history. A gun. He didn't carry a gun for very long because somebody quickly realized it was contrary to who and what he was. Here's a character whose parents had been killed by guns. A gun was anathema to him. It was something he really didn't want to touch. It was what had made him who he was. And it's much more heroic to solve the problem without simply being able to shoot the villain than having to use your wits and your other abilities. Instead of packing heat, Bruce Wayne relied on other, more innovative crime-fighting methods. Methods that became increasingly sophisticated over the years. In 1940, for example, Batman used infrared night vision goggles a technology being developed at the time by the U.S. Navy. Night vision is heat vision, is literally what it is. If you think about light, everyone's familiar with the spectrum of the rainbow, the red, yellow, green, blue. There's also different spectrums that we can't see. And infrared is what we refer to when we're talking about the type of radiation you get from heat. So any hot body will emit this type of radiation, and you can design cameras to detect it. And so night vision is basically looking at that wavelength of light. Batman has lots of gadgets, but Batman's great thing was that many of them are all small enough to fit in his utility belt. And making things small can be a challenge, but it's not technologically impossible. And that's driving a lot of technology these days, is how can we make things smaller and smaller and still function the way we want them to. One early gadget Batman had in his utility belt was a miniature camera the device was inspired by the ones actually being used by spies in the years prior to Batman's debut. Clandestine photography goes back into the 1930s with the commercial Minox camera. This was a camera that was invented in 1934 by a Latvian engineer by the name of Walter Zapp. 
His idea for the camera was a camera that could be held in one hand. But if you're not very dexterous with his camera, it does take two hands to cycle the film. In the commercial world, that's not an issue. But in our world, that draws attention, and we don't like that. Our challenge is to make a camera that can be easily concealed in one hand, small enough that it can be easily palmed. We want to be able to easily manipulate it with one hand. And while we're at it, we're CIA. We're always going to try to process and prove. We're going to make ours take twice as many shots. This is the camera that did it. This is the agency's first sub-miniature document copy camera. A camera like this is like one Batman might have in his utility belt. In the late 1940s and early 50s, as the world entered the atomic age, Batman's use of real science literally rocketed into the realm of science fiction. In the 50s, a lot of the, the fiction was very science fiction based. So, you know, Batman had ray guns. They flew in spaceships and things like that. It was just reflective of the times. In Batman number 109, the caped crusader used a heat ray to detonate explosives floating in Gotham City Harbor. It seemed far-fetched at the time, and was. But believe it or not, the U.S. military is currently working on just such a device to add to its arsenal. A heat ray is a low-frequency infrared kind of light, and the Army today is developing weapons based on heat rays much like the one that Batman used. Called the Active Denial System, this non-lethal weapon directs high-frequency microwaves over distances up to 550 yards. Roger, I'm ready for a 100% shot, three Move. seconds on the CLT. Its heat ray is about as hot as a light bulb and can penetrate the clothing of aggressors without seriously harming them. As the 1960s ushered in technology that fueled the space race, Batman stayed a step ahead with advances of his own. In the 60s, as computer systems, mainframes came into play, then people began to catch on to computerization. Batman had databases in the Batcave. The first visible manifestation I saw of what a computer could be was the use of that technology on Batman. I think that was true for, probably for millions of kids. And maybe I was inclined to be a technology geek and learn how to do the programming in the early years because of it. By the time the 90s came around, his computer systems were so sophisticated that he could tap into the law enforcement networks and keep on top of crime. In today's world of GPS and cellular communications, the line between science fiction and science fact is getting thinner than ever. You want his science to be based upon something that is that is real technology as well, so therefore it doesn't break the conceit that you can be Batman and Batman can exist in our world. In movie incarnations like Batman Begins and The Dark Knight, Batman's weapons and gadgets have to stand up to ever-increasing scrutiny from audiences. All of the tools that, that he uses therefore have to have some credible basis in scientific reality. We really wanted to sort of dress from the point of view of, yes, if you had limitless financial resources, could you focus that and apply that to creating some very extraordinary, useful crime-fighting techniques? In the Chris Nolan vision of Batman, everything has a, what I call a hyper-reality basis to it. So in the area of technology, Bruce Wayne and Batman would always take things and convert them from what we today would think is part of the real world. But as Batman's arsenal must meet the demands of 21st century technology, so too must his basic equipment, and that includes the most sensational suit ever worn by a caped crime fighter. It's the costume that transformed Bruce Wayne, would be crime fighter, into an icon of heroism, justice, and strength. The Bat Suit. The Bat Suit has been a key part of its owner's mystique from the very beginning. But it wasn't always a source of protection. It starts as a symbol, a creature of the night, something to terrify. It's designed to make you A, anonymous, B, more than human all at the same time. 
Originally, Batman's suit was made of cloth. It could be easily torn and didn't include any special technology. The first evolution of the Batman suit takes place in the late 1950s. The editors felt that strange, weird new looks were part of how to sell the story. You would do stories like Undersea Batman, where there would be a special Batman costume just for going underwater. And that began the introduction of the suit as technology. Given the weaponry that he's facing and the, and the situations he's created, you have to believe he needs more in his arsenal in order to combat the greater threat that he keeps on facing. The whole idea of it becoming essentially a suit of armor evolved over the years. The inspiration for some of the technology of the Batsuit was almost accidental. When DC artists added a yellow circle to the suit, one that looked like a bullseye, writers were inspired to add a new aspect to the outfit. When they started addressing the question of it being a bullseye, they took that opportunity to go, well, yeah, okay, then it is a bullseye. He wears Kevlar behind that section of the costume, hoping that criminals will actually fire at that. And it's bulletproof. Well, once you start doing that, the next logical question is, well, if you're gonna wear Kevlar there, why aren't you wearing Kevlar under the entire costume? Kevlar bi-weave, reinforced joints. Terror resistant. This sucker will stop a knife. Bulletproof. Anything but a straight shot. Kevlar's cool. It's five times stronger than steel. And when woven in layers, like three to seven layers, it will protect the body. Developed by DuPont in 1965, Kevlar material gets its life-saving properties from the unique way its synthetic fibers are woven. In Kevlar, you have a bunch of fibers that are interweaved with each other. And so as they get hit, they actually stretch. The individual threads are fighting against each other and it can resist very large impacts and high-speed bullets without actually breaking. So if you have a suit made of Kevlar and you want to know how close you can be to someone who's shooting at you, interesting question is less the range than the actual size of the bullet and the speed. And Kevlar vests can cover a wide range and most, you know, hand pistols and even some shotguns, you know, Batman would be very safe against even up at close range. In the dark night, Batman's Kevlar suit gets an upgrade to the next level in defensive gear. I'd been looking for the story reasons for redesigning the suit, and then it occurred to me it's actually very simple. We just would have it be the, the real reason we did redesign it, which is he wants to be able to move faster and more flexibly, and that's what we put into the story. Hardened Kevlar plates over titanium-dipped tri-weave fibers for flexibility. It'll be lighter, faster, more agile. Perhaps you should read the instructions first. Yeah. We collected together, you know, read about and looked at all these sort of Under Armour suits, what the army use. So we just set about redesigning the suit. We see that it's made up of much more facets, like a suit of armor. The separate plates of armor of the new bat suit are anchored on an elastic mesh. It's 110 components to this suit. We decided that smaller armoured plates would allow a crumple zone between those armoured plates and allow him more movement. The Batsuit's flexible, armour-plated design parallels an actual technology called ceramic armour, made by companies like Ceridine Incorporated in Costa Mesa, California. Their ceramic plating has the resistance of steel, the material that's long been used to stop bullets. But ceramic plating is 70% lighter. To stop the bullet, you have to break the bullet. Therefore, you need something that is harder than the bullet. The lightest weight, hardest material known to man for these types of applications is known as boron carbide. Boron carbide is a black crystalline powder. When heated to extreme temperatures and formed into ceramic plating, it becomes nearly as hard as diamonds. So where you are right now are in the hot pressing area. This is where we take a powder and we make it into the lightest, hardest material known to man. Transforming the particles into armor begins by pouring the powder into forms and then compressing the material. The armor molds are then put into a hot press. And behind me, you can see the hot presses. These are induction heated and they operate at temperatures close to 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The plates are then cooled, but they're not safe to be used as armor yet. 
In certain high impacts, ceramic armor plating still will shatter. But that's actually a benefit because it really dissipates the energy into the shattering of the material instead of your body. But shards of shattered ceramic plating can still be deadly if they enter the body. To prevent this lethal possibility, a special resin is fused to the back of each piece of armor to catch the broken shards. The final step is we have to put out an outer layer. The outer layer is called the spall shield. So when a bullet comes in, not only do you stop it and catch the fragments in the back, but there may be a little bit that tends to fly in the wrong direction. This will stop it. Armored protection, like Batman has in his suit, is essential to military personnel around the world. As shown in this video, taken by an enemy sniper, ceramic plating can be a soldier's best defense when under attack. The shot was aimed at the soldier's heart, but he survived thanks to his body armor. Development of the Ceridine armor has resulted in thousands of lives being saved. You can hold the muzzle up against a guy's chest and pull the trigger, and we'll stop that bullet. For my opinion, you need to lighten up. Batman can not only take a bullet, he can also literally take the heat. Thanks to the fact that his suit is made of the real fireproof material known as Nomex. Nomex is used in firefighters' uniforms, welders can wear it, um, racing car drivers can wear it, anyone who's at chance of being near a high flame situation or an explosion. When exposed to flame, regular cotton fabric ignites instantly. But clothing made of Nomex doesn't burn. It doesn't catch on fire, it doesn't melt, and it doesn't do any of the horrible things you think of when you're in fire, so that you can withstand fires for minutes without melting, burning, or igniting. Nomex is a fiber with built-in flame resistance. When exposed to intense heat, the fibers carbonize and become thicker, creating a protective barrier between the suit and a person's skin. Batman can basically walk through flames with this material, and the only thing he'll feel really is the heat. And if Batman rolls and falls and gets the fire out within a few minutes, he's certainly going to be fine. One of the essential parts of any superhero suit is his cape. And Batman is no exception. But his cape benefits from a blend of real life tech and the type only found in the labs of Wayne Enterprises. Do you have any lightweight fabrics? You know, I think I have just a thing. It's called memory cloth. Notice anything? Molecules realign, become rigid. What kind of shapes can you make? It can be tailored to fit in any structure based on a rigid skeleton. On first glance, the fantastic fabric seems like, well, a fabrication. But surprisingly, scientists say material with memory is in the works. And someday, items like Batman's amazing cape may become solid objects with the help of magnetism. One that's been under active development is something called magnetorheological fluids. You have a fluid with little particles in it that when you apply magnetic fields, they all line up and they become very, very stiff. The problem is the amount they move is very small. So you would need a lot of them to have any sort of effect on your cloth. But it is not something that's technologically impossible. It's just something we haven't figured out how to do completely yet. Okay, so let's say Batman's cape can harden into a wing. That doesn't mean he can automatically conquer the challenges of flight. Even real bats have difficulty accomplishing the feat. Bats are not very effective flyers. They're excellent gliders. The energetics involved in bat flight is really quite high. They're not particularly graceful. But Batman's method of flight doesn't involve the flapping motions used by real bats. If you look at the Batman films closely, you will find that he starts from a high location and gets to a low altitude through the use of his cape. And in this regard, the cape really is not a flight mechanism, but more of a gliding mechanism. If you have figured out how to make the memory fabric in this cape, it can give you the necessary lift to at least glide and float for some distance. The challenges you have to figure out are how to get enough lift to travel the distance he wants to do. It's the speed that he moves forward with that's the key. So he might do it by falling enough distance and let gravity speed him up. And for that, he'd need to come from a high enough building. Believe it or not, 
people can actually glide like the caped crusader. In our world, we may not have Batman's transforming cape, but we do have something similar, wingsuits. The way this thing works is there's, there's a slit right here. Air goes in the arms and fills up the suit. Actually, this whole entire suit is one big wing. The whole entire thing fills up with air, and that's kind of what helps you fly. You're not just controlled fly. Audio jungle. Audio jungle. The same way that we expect Batman's cape to work. You have the fabric shaped between your arms and your body and your legs in a way that gives you an airfoil type effect, a wing-like effect that generates lift as you move forward through the air. But if you look at the way they use wingsuits, you can tell that there's some dangers there in terms of the way Batman uses his cape, as most of the people using a wingsuit also have a parachute for the last bit um, to get them down to the ground safely. Of course, not all of Batman's technological tricks are in his suit. For others, you have to look closer. Inside the most mysterious and versatile toolbox in superhero history, the utility belt. Of all the technologies Batman uses, there's one that's gotten him out of more tight spots than any other, his utility belt. Hasn't every kid who read these comic books had a utility belt? Didn't you have a utility belt when you were a kid? Batman's gadget-packed wonder is not unlike kits used by counterintelligence crime fighters, though Batman's belt is more compact. Batman used the technology that was available to him at the time. Our traveling technical officers do the same thing. They carry a small kit with commercially available items. The kit even contains lockpicking devices, just like Batman's, but ours requires special membership and ID. Over the years, Batman's utility belt has contained scores of gadgets, some of them more far-fetched than others. I always thought the rebreather was very cool. A rebreather is something that you sort of fit in your mouth and allows you to breathe underwater for a short period of time, longer than you could by holding your breath. But many of Batman's gadgets are based in real technology. Take, for instance, his flexible fiber optic periscope. Fiber optics are, are very common materials now. You can see them in a lot of kid toys. Um, they're the nice little glass fibers at the end that shine the lights out the end. And basically what you do is bend light. Then as the light tries to bounce out of the tube, it actually reflects back in. We call this total internal reflection. The light stays inside the device. Even if you bend it through a fairly sharp angle or curve, it's the properties of the material it's made out of that keeps the light inside the fiber. And so you can take this periscope made out of fi uh, fiber optics and bend it around corners and twist it around as much as you need to to get where you want to look, and the light coming in one end will come out the other, and you can see what you're looking at. It's you, isn't it? The other kids won't believe me. Of course, other tools in Batman's belt are more lethal. His thermite bombs work like hand grenades do. What Batman would be very successful at is getting through doors, windows. A more unusual weapon is Batman's signature Batarang, the Dark Knight's version of a boomerang. The Batarang was always my favorite. I always thought that was the coolest. Every kid in their own home is sitting there trying to build their own Batarang and see if they work. Each arm of a real boomerang is contoured like an airplane wing. When thrown, the rotating airfoils help give the device lift, similar to the way propellers lift a helicopter. A boomerang circles back to its launching point due to gyroscopic precession, a phenomenon that causes a spinning object to maintain its axis and direction as it rotates. Some of Batman's batarangs have similar aerodynamics, but others outfitted with cumbersome items like flashbulbs, cameras, police whistles and bombs might have more trouble getting off the ground. In Batman Begins, the Batarang was entirely reconceptualized as a martial arts style throwing star. The Batarang was a very early piece of equipment of Batman's and we felt it was very important to sort of make that part of his belt but it had to be a very high-tech version of it so it's smaller but it's still a pretty lethal weapon. Why bats, Master Wayne? 
That's frightened me. This time my enemies shared my dread. But the most famous use of the Batarang in the comics is as a grappling tool, a device that has now evolved into a grappling gun. And like many others, this technology is anchored solidly in science. To have the grappling hook reach the top of the building, this is relatively easy. You're not looking at anything, anything more powerful than some very simple spring-loaded guns, air guns, compressor things that you could easily imagine in the size of the handgun. Batman's grappling system also packs enough power to lift the Dark Knight off the ground and into the air in mere seconds. That much liftoff would take a powerful motorized mechanism, one that factors in both Batman's weight and speed of travel. If you look in the movie and estimate the speeds he's going up, you're looking at a power that's around 5,000 watts. To put that in perspective, typical light bulbs are 60 or 100 watts, so you're talking you know, maybe 50 times the power in a standard light bulb. That might sound like a lot, but it's not too bad. You can actually generate that power. And in fact, people have made devices that can pull people up. One of those devices is the Atlas-powered rope ascender used by the US Army. The Atlas is really similar in a lot of ways to what Batman's using right out of the comic book or the movies. Now, the system is designed to pull a very large load up a rope extremely quickly. Uh, it's great for rapid escape, search and rescue, all sorts of things that Batman's actually doing. The Atlas also lets its user do a controlled descent down the side of a building or a mountain. And its mechanism is relatively simple. It's a lot like a capstan winch on a sailboat. And the capstan basically gives you a very strong circumferential grip around something round when you apply a load to the rope. To engage the rope, you simply wrap it around that capstan winch mechanism in the device, close the lid, and pull the trigger. To operate it, it's like a, a portable drill, variable speed trigger. You pull the trigger more, you're going to go up faster. Built for combat search and rescue and other vertical tactical operations, the Atlas can swiftly lift over 500 pounds. So just like Batman's grappling system, carrying two people isn't a problem. A fully loaded soldier is always going to weigh at least about 300 pounds. In the infantry, the lightest pack load that men have is about 75 pounds. From there on, it only gets heavier. So we want to be able to accommodate a soldier and a fully loaded pack at all times. Additionally, if you need to use this device for rescue, it makes it so that you can clip yourself and an additional person in and lift them both at the same time. We built more like a truck that's for vertical operations. So this system's rugged, it can be used a lot, it's got very long battery life, uh, and can lift a very high load repeatedly. So this is more of a utilitarian system than what Batman actually has. Batman's utility belt may be the ultimate in compact crime fighting, but the caped crusader doesn't always think small. And Batman tech doesn't get any bigger or cooler than an automobile that's become a pop culture icon. At least tell me what it looks like. Never mind. What's that? More the tumbler? Oh, you wouldn't be interested in that. Since 1941, Batman has cruised the streets of Gotham City in a car that pays flashy tribute to his nocturnal namesake. But whether it's got scalloped fins, a bat's head battering ram, or a jet-propelled engine, the Batmobile may be the most coveted item in all Batman tech. I think the Batmobile had a major influence on me. I mean, I was fascinated by it. I wanted to drive it, I wanted to see it, and I think it kind of got me into cars at an early age that way. Artists and writers have kept improving on the Batmobile's design, with additions and overhauls reflecting car trends of the day. The ever-changing Batmobile. You know, you see a different Batmobile for every year. You see a different Batmobile for every generation. In the 40s, you had the big grill, which was kind of cool. The first Batmobile I remember was the Batmobile of the 50s with the huge bat fin on the back and the bat-headed battering ram in the front. It was big enough to be a tank. Then he got into the 60s and the car evolved to match the one in the television series with the atomic turbines. 
then in the early 70s, it became a sports car. I always thought that was the coolest. I mean, the whole idea that this singular unique vehicle belongs to a singular unique character. So what do you think? Does it come in black? As Batman's enemies got tougher, so did his car. Make a color. Uh, it's a black tank. And no retooling of the Batmobile was more radical than the one showcased in Batman Begins. Hold on. <laughs> Director Christopher Nolan and designer Nathan Crowley set out to create a 21st century ride. One whose practicality and power would help set the tone for the entire film. The purpose of redesigning the Batmobile, which we call the Tumbler, was to have it have capabilities that we felt a crime fighter would need to have in the modern day. The Tumbler was the first thing we designed because I felt that if we could show the, the studio what the Batmobile was in our world, they'd get a handle on what everything else would be. Action! I felt that we needed a new contemporary approach in order to believe in the utility of this vehicle. So what I proposed was a cross between a Lamborghini and a Humvee, something that would have the presence of almost a tank-like vehicle, but also with the speed and grace of a sports car. She was built as a bridging vehicle. During combat, two of these would jump over a river towing cables. It needed to have a jet engine in it to allow it to jump over rivers or whatever in order to take the equipment across. It needed to have armor to protect it from taking hits. Also has the ability to drive in a stealth mode with uh, an engine that's incredibly quiet, so it can sort of disappear into the environment. I lost them. We lost them. It's a pretty cool piece of equipment. The tumbler seems surprisingly realistic, but how much of it would actually work? Let's start with the aerodynamics. In spite of its weight of about 5,000 pounds, the tumbler can achieve impressive speed. The Tumbler is a big, bulky, tank-like machine, but uh, probably can go about 120, 130 miles an hour. Credit goes to its surprisingly sleek design. Just as airplane flaps generate lift to make a plane go up, the Tumbler uses flaps to push the vehicle down and achieve greater velocity. The theory behind it is that it's got all these little aerofoils on the outside that all make tiny little wings. Uh, instead of having one big as an aircraft. The other key aerodynamic element, surprisingly, is the airflow under the car. And this is actually what racing cars use. If you can design that air under the car to go significantly faster than the air on the top of the car, you get low pressure under the car, and the high pressure on top pushes you down on the ground. So if you want to understand how the tumbler gains stability by having the air blow underneath it, you can just take a piece of paper you can generate high pressure on top and a low pressure underneath by blowing under the paper, and the paper will be forced down. Speed is one thing, but how does something as large as the tumbler manage to maneuver so well? Weight does have a great effect on maneuverability. You have all this mass you have to move around. It's transmitted through the wheels and tires to the road. Really, got to hand it to the designers, automotive-wise. It's quite a feat of engineering. They seem to have each wheel is, is kind of balanced out by itself without an axle running across the middle. Both wheels are totally independent, so you, one, one wheel can actually stop, and the other wheel can rotate, so the thing turns right on a dime. And it can do that at any speed. That's what's so amazing about it. i got to get me one of those. The Tumbler is designed to get some of its momentum from a jet-powered engine. Another detail rooted in reality. Jet-powered cars have been used to set land speed records, and they've even made brief trips into the consumer world. They've tried to use jet engines in cars throughout history, 
1963, Chrysler introduced the turbine car. 50 models they made uh, had a jet engine in it. Uh, they only gave them to about 200 customers for three months each. It was a very experimental program. Most people who drove it loved it. Unfortunately, the car wasn't great on gas mileage. It's a very complicated car, and it kind of died uh, a few years later. Over here on the throttle, flip that open and throttle up. This will boost you into a rampless jump. Not now! On screen, the tumbler can also make unassisted or rampless jumps. If it comes off perfectly parallel to the ground, it's always going to fall a little bit. And so if it's jumping to something that's a little bit lower, it's okay. If it wants to jump to something at the same height or higher, it needs some form of lift or it needs to come off at a slight angle. The way you could do this is imagine a little bit of a wheelie as you take off. You don't actually need a ramp to get a little bit of vertical velocity, especially since you've got the jet engine on the back to give you that extra thrust. You just get the front end of the car up a little bit, fire your jet engine, and now you're going off at an angle. You know, we were confident that we could do some pretty amazing jumps and it land and drive off, you know, not the classic thing where you, the car jumps, lands, falls apart, and then you cut and put another car in and drive away. You know, we, we were proud of the fact that we could do all that and still carry on the seasons. If you had powerful enough hydraulics or electromagnetic shots up front, and then you had a very powerful jet engine that aimed down a little bit, you might be able to get enough of a leaping effect to go uh, 10, 20, 30 feet in the air. The real danger is the landing. He's going to be landing at a very high speed. So the front end of the car has to have the stability and the shock system to survive that jump. And in fact, if you look closely, the Batmobile does some interesting thing. The front wheels extend, there's extra shock absorbers there, and when it hits the ground, it slows down over that longer distance that enables it to survive the impact. The Batmobile Tumbler is certainly impressive, but the tech team at Wayne Enterprises isn't resting on its automotive laurels. These days, Batman's got a new and even more outrageous way to navigate the mean streets of Gotham City. The prehistoric world transforms into a battlefield. Place, there's only one rule. Survive. Jurassic Fight Club, a new series, premieres July 29th at 9, only on History. Will you be wanting the bat pod, sir? In the middle of the day, Alfred? Not very subtle. The Lamborghini, then. Much more subtle. Over the years, Batman has used his technological know-how to create countless vehicles to help him fight enemies like the Joker. <laughs> He's had bat planes, bat boats, bat copters, and even a vehicle that could go from the air to under the sea. Three years after Batman Begins, its sequel, The Dark Knight, pushed Batman tech even further. One of the joys of working on a character who's been around for thousands of stories is you have to continually ask, how do I top this? The answer, the Bat Pod, a bold new vehicle that's part motorcycle and part lethal weapon. It's something which looks like some crazy Vikings idea of a customized uh, motorbike. It looks formidable. And like everything with the movie, it works. It looks raw and it looks very extreme. It looks really powerful and dangerous. So I think that is sort of, it's sort of the bad boy, you know? Batman. The task as usual was to build something that could really go fast, make turns, you know, the usual outrageous, you know, <laughs> parameters. It really had to belong to the same family as the Batmobile, so that's where we started. I'd hesitate to even call this a motorcycle just because it's so different from the way a motorcycle typically handles. I mean, there isn't really a seat. You're lying down on your belly and your legs are splayed apart three and a half feet. Riding the back pod in a practically prone position gives the Dark Knight an aerodynamic edge. 
the low profile technique is frequently used by professional racers. Grand Prix motorcycle racers, whenever they get a chance, whenever they're on a straightaway, they duck down and they make themselves as small as possible. And it's that aerodynamic drag they're trying to eliminate. When Batman is down on the bat pod in that position, he's eliminating drag and he's a lot less exposed. And he's also lowering the center of gravity, so he has more control over the vehicle. The bat pod weighs about 700 pounds. Because it's so large, controlling the bike takes extra skill, including the use of special handlebars, which act as arm shields. The steering of it was totally unconventional. He had these big cowls that came around his arms. That he, had, he was more from his shoulder, actually, that he steered. Well, you want to use more of your body weight to turn a bike, and on this, you're going to, I think that if you're not just using your, your arms and your hands placed on a handlebar, but you've got this action so that you're in these arm shields that help you sort of lean the bike in, that's going to help you maneuver it. So that you're really forced to use your body weight to control it as opposed to just arms because you'd have to be Arnold Schwarzenegger in order to be able to turn that kind of tire on a motorcycle. Besides the way it's steered, the bat pod is also unique in the way it's propelled. Well, the thing that strikes me the most about this is that where you would expect the motor to be, it doesn't exist. It's not in the middle of the bike. A standard motorcycle has a single engine in the center of the vehicle. On screen, the bat pod is intended to have not one, 